Hello and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, Michael just disappeared under the table. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to close the door. And uh, if I step aside, you actually see the sun shining through the. Yeah, you've got a halo room. now. So it's very bright. Yeah, exactly. I got a halo. S Saint, and, uh, Saint Michael and Alex uh, do the uh, discover aura DB free. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you for joining. Hi, Michael. I uh, hope you're doing Hi, all right. I uh, hope the weather is better yeah. where you are uh, than where it is here. Yeah, it's, it's raining. It's bright sunshine. So it rained yeah. tonight, which was really good. So we got at least some water, but uh, it's definitely more needed uh, as such. Uh, it is needed, it's definitely yes. Definitely way too little water. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, a lot of stuff happening and... Uh, I heard you are going to Graph Summit uh, today as well. So... Yes, I'm heading to to Graph Summit in a in, in an hour, basically, or well, an hour we do the stream, but then afterwards, um, yep. for uh, for Graph Summit in Milan. So Graph Summit kicked off. I don't know if you saw this um, in our uh, Twin for J. If you if you reading uh, the updates, then uh, kicked off this week. Uh, yesterday, actually, in Paris with a with a, um, a full day event in. Uh, uh, in Paris, and today I think it is Amsterdam, and next week, yep. uh, or actually this week, continuing over to um, uh, maybe I'll show my screen for uh, for yep. this. Uh, so if you, yeah, yeah. yeah, here we go. So if you go to um, neo4j.com/slash/graphsummit, you go to this page, and then you see um, all the events that are taking place over the next uh, couple of weeks. So it's like the <clears throat> Uh, early summer, of, beginning of uh, of summer, um, uh, show uh, round in uh, across a couple of cities in uh, Europe as well as in uh, Asia, and uh, yeah, today uh, Amsterdam, tomorrow Milan and Brussels, um, next week Berlin, Munich, Madrid, then the week after Zurich, London, Manchester, the week after uh, Tel Aviv, and then in September uh, Stockholm and Cologne, and um, obviously in July. Oh, yeah. Um, Sydney, Melbourne, Singapore, Bangalore. So, um, if you're interested, <clears throat> if you're interested in uh, in this, I post a link in chat. Uh, register for the city that is closest to you, uh, and have a, have a look at it. So, um, just grabbing one uh, agenda point here, so you know what's 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 it, it's going to be like. So, if you missed Graph Connect, oh, this is Italian. Maybe not this one then. <laughs> Um, maybe, but, yeah, exactly. Um, so um, this is the agenda. So we will have um, uh, an overview of uh, of what's happened at Graph Connect a little bit in a, in a in a short condensed form. So you see what is Neo4j. You see um, what's happened over the past uh, couple of months, and that's what's what's an outlook into the future. The knowledge graph, uh, customer presentation, uh, panels. And then in the afternoon, we have workshops on um, graph data science as well as graph database. So you can uh, get a little two hours um, hands-on session going. And then in some events, uh, we finish off with um, um, a meetup uh, in Berlin. We will have a meetup. So Michael will be there. I will be there. So if you are yeah. uh, from, uh, from the area, come join us uh, and hang out yes. at the meetup. And you will also be in Munich. So you, Alex, will be in Milano. And, uh, exactly. Uh, I'll be in Milan tomorrow. I will be exactly in, in Munich and Berlin and Tel Aviv. And you will be in Berlin and uh, Munich next week. Yep. So. Exactly. So if you can make it, join us there. Exactly. All right. But then let's go over to the actual topic, uh, which we wanted to discuss today. So that's obviously... Um, Discover Neo4j Aura DB free with Michael and Alex. Uh, so as it says here, um, keep it interactive. So if you are watching this live in chat, uh, let us know um, if you have any questions, any any feedback, any any other uh, anything is on your mind regarding graphs and Neo4j or anything else. Uh, <laughs> have it, have at it, uh, and, and type it in. So we uh, we're happy to to make this uh, interactive with you. Generally, what's going to happen is. Um, I'll give a quick recap of, of what is Neo4j or DB free. We pick a data set. Again, if you have a data set you'd like us to explore, let us know, send it to us, Twitter, Discord, community forum, wherever else. Um, and we, um, we have a look at that. 
we think about a couple of questions we ask of the data model, we determine set data model, and then we do some loading and querying of the data. Um, what is AuraDB free? So it's a free version of Neo4j AuraDB and the, the sizes have changed. So last time we talked about this and I was I was surprised. Yes, now now I it's it's confirmed and it's public. So um, the limitations got increased by quite a bit. So if you are interested in trying out Graph Database as a service uh, or you know Graph Database in general, go to this link. I will put the link in chat in a second also, and just register. Uh, all you need to do is type in an email address and a couple of other data points, and then you're good to go. You get now 200,000 nodes, 400,000 relationships. So that's pretty significant up, up, uptake. And uh, I think that's probably enough for, for anything. I mean, we were, I think this is episode number 27 or something. So we did quite a few, 28. Yeah. <clears throat> or 28. So we, we had a couple of times we had to slice it down a little bit in terms of data size because we were at the edges of, of, of the old limitations. This limitation is basically uh, free, so I mean it's really yeah. it's really good. You get access to Neo4j Bloom and browser, so um, that's the, data the you need to add and data importer. I, I need to add data importer now as well. Um, so <clears throat> good point. Uh, it's free forever, and um, and you get it uh, by going to this link, which I will put in chat. So um, today we are doing uh, cybersecurity data because we have uh, something cool to show you uh, around that. Yep. Um, before uh, we go there, I'd like to do one other shout out on uh, because it fits the topic so well. I had to, I had to do it. Uh, there is just this was just released. Uh, I think actually la end of last week. Graph for cybersecurity, a white paper. So it's lots of text, but it is actually also somewhat technical so it has code snippets it has some some uh, some best practice um, bits and pieces so uh, let me scroll down a little yeah. bit so there's a bloom bloom session um, here some some coding um, yeah. how, how to build a digital twin for cybersecurity some some networking some uh, data modeling advice uh, and tips and tricks so it is it is a pretty hefty uh, piece of um, of text to read. So if you are, you know, interested in that, if this is something you want to know more about, have uh, a look at that. I'll post the link how to get it uh, also in chat. So uh, this is brand new, uh, written by a couple of my colleagues or our colleagues, Dave, really Gal, fitting. TJ. So it's it's a it's a great fit. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now let's dive in uh, the actual data and demo so here we go now your screen yeah, is visible exactly yep. i just wanted to mention something else as well. <laughs> uh, just today so many announcements there's so many announcements yeah, indeed yeah. um so just today uh, we launched the uh, building the uh, applications with dot net so mm -hmm. uh, before we started with node uh, python java and go and now we have also the dot net course so we cover now all the five official drivers of neo oh, nice and so if you're a dot net person if, or if you want to get started with dot net it gets you uh, set up with ASP.NET Core uh, uh, and builds an IMDB cloud basically, and uh, will automatically create a sandbox for you and and then guides you through the, the setup, how to get started, and there's a GitHub repository that is accompanying and and then basically step by step you learn all the bits and pieces that you need to do to build an application uh, or an API backend with Neo4j uh, in .NET. So. It's pretty cool. I did the Java one, and so it's uh, pretty comprehensive. And if you have not mm -hmm. uh, tapped your feet into that, uh, please check it out and also give us feedback. Let us know how it, how it goes. Um, so I'll send a link to Alec. We can put it into chat as well, I think. Yeah. Do this real quick. I'll put the link to the to Graph Academy in chat already. So um, Yeah, and then exactly, then you can find the link. Find it there, but I'll, well. I'll add the, the deep yeah. link. Yes. Cool. Wow. Um, and without further ado, uh, we have a bu bunch of new things that's happening. So in, uh, if you go to ORDB uh, free now, so first of all, it fills in an instance name. It's probably not the instance name that I want to use, but I call it cybersecurity. Um, and then we go to Belgium uh, region. And then you see here, 
so far we usually had used to have movies and an empty database and starting this week uh, we're getting more data sets so that's actually something that i'll be working on is kind of adding more data sets uh to the org e3 very cool experience right and uh, so i can select this uh, click on create instance and the next new thing is actually popping up directly um uh, so this form looks a little bit different than before and has two big uh, differences so one is kind of that advice to change the initial password uh, for security reasons. But the other thing that's really cool is you can just download your credentials as an um, as an uh, text file. And it's actually the correct format also for the Graph Academy courses and other uh, places where you use environment variables uh, to look at your credentials as well. Oh, so okay. um, we'll I'll just open text edit real quick. And so if you look at this, because that's only in temporary database anyway, right? So you can see here, it has like a note that it takes about 60 seconds to hit the endpoint, but uh, then it's available. But mm -hmm. then we have Neo4j UI, username and password and the instance name as well. So if you are building cool. an application, you can just save this and then you don't lose your password anymore, right? So because that's mm -hmm. kind of also in the, in, the, in the file as well. And as, as you can see, this is like an environment variable, so you can basically just source it or you can uh, use it as a uh, .env file or properties file uh, in your application as well, which is really nice. So Very that's good. the other new thing that, that happened, uh, which is really cool. So, um, so even if I forget to copy this one, I always have the password uh, to save. Now so you've got to download it exactly, and you can yeah, exactly. look into there. Can always go back. Okay, and uh, if you open this uh, now, it will take a little bit uh, to, to set up. Um, but something I wanted to say is actually Dave Futila, one of the authors of the cybersecurity paper, was also uh, the person who originally created the cybersecurity data set. Uh, so we can actually see that these um, examples are all on GitHub as well. So if you go to new Graph examples, uh, we have all the data sets that we usually put on Sandbox. But you also have cybersecurity in here. And uh, the cybersecurity one comes with uh, the data that's in, imported into Neo4j's database, but also code examples. So if you want to use, let's say, JavaScript and want to query this uh, data set, uh, we have basically uh, example queries and connection details and how you basically could access mm -hmm. uh, data here, right? um, which is quite nice. And then in the in the readme, there's also a little bit more like uh, detail on a data model and an example um, as well, right? So and um, so all the details are uh, in here as well. So if you want to use this yourself, you can always fork the repository and then basically do whatever you you want with the code or the um, or the data as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's. Not too large. It's only like a thousand nodes and five thousand relationships, but it's interesting enough to uh, basically show us uh, an interesting domain. So let me just open this in a new tab. Uh, the image, uh, so we can look at this. Um, so our domain is pretty uh, involved. So we have basically uh, users that have access uh, to certain resources like computers, groups, and uh, domains. Uh, they're part of uh, uh, groups, for instance, as well. Uh, there is uh, relationships like um, who's an admin to something, who's a member of a certain group, who has allow to execute permissions, things like that. Um, computer are contained in organizational units, uh, which are then connected to an uh, GP. And um, the domain is uh, also basically connected to the group and the organization unit as well. Right, so that's basically a, a model that represents Active Directory. So if you ever use an Lego Windows domain or an LDAP model, that's kind of a subset of the uh, Windows domain security thing. And now our database should be running. So we can uh, basically go to the query tab and the query opens near the browser and we can just paste in our password here. And it immediately opens the interactive browser guide here on the, on the, on the left side. Right, so uh, with a little bit of explanation about cybersecurity and why it's important and uh, it becomes more interesting and why also graphs are a really interesting tool uh, if you look at cybersecurity because if you look at the raw data of just network events, network pack packages and uh, information that's usually contained in tables or 
or um, JSON payloads, you don't really see the connections between things, right? You don't see immediately which users are part, um, which uh, users are part of a certain group, who has accessed which resources, and, and so on. So that's something where, in, in a graph, you see this really visually, which is really nice, right? Uh, so you can see kind of what is at risk, are certain permissions not correctly set up, uh, are certain uh, resources not enough protected, for instance, or do certain people not have permissions to access information? And then if you go further than this, then you look at, can you look at cyber attacks and cyber threats as well, right? So where you basically then can, if you have modeled your network as a graph, um, then you can also verify that there's, for instance, only one entry point uh, to your graph by pulling in all the um, network configuration, file, firewall configuration and other things as well into, into this graph. So this guide kind of walks us through some of the example uh, queries uh, on this domain. And if you if look at the data here, uh, we see basically what we saw in the, in the uh, data model. So for instance, we have, uh, let's say users in here, a uh, bunch of users with information like uh, domain company, is the user enabled or disabled one, when did they last log in, um, what kind of object ID uh, do they have in the in the domain and, and, and so on, right? Password resets and so on. The same, sim very similar is uh, basically for groups. Uh, so we have different groups that have uh, different IDs and then contain are uh, contained in other groups or have users that are in groups, right? So that, for instance, if you have this member of relationship here, we see uh, this is a group which is contained or which is a member of this um, computer or domain. And then uh, we can basically model these memberships as well. And um, the other thing is organization units, like uh, different departments and, and other things and, and branches of your company as well. Um, the other thing that's in this data set is something called high value. That's a bunch of uh, groups and uh, domains and, and, and computers that are uh, basically uh, marked as very critical to the infrastructure for whatever reason, right? And, and this can, can be something that we can use in EOJ, actually these multiple labels, uh, where you can um, assign more than one label to a node can, for instance, be also be used to identify something like, this is very valuable, this is active, this is not active, and, and things like that. And so, and so in this data set, a bunch of those have been marked as uh, high value. So some of the queries around this will also touch these high value items. Okay, if you go back to our guide, uh, it basically shows us in the uh, on the first or on the second slide that actually the information is pulled from Bloodhound and Bloodhound is actually an open source project for cybersecurity. And uh, let me just open the GitHub repo. Yeah. Um, so Bloodhound is basically an, a tool that runs on top of Active Directory, scans all the information from Active Directory and then has even its own UI uh, that allows you to analyze the data. Uh, so you log in and then basically you, you can visualize and analyze this data more from a um, cybersecurity uh, domain admin point of view. Uh, so it's not like free from querying like we do with Cypher, mm -hmm. but it's more like something like, uh, I want to mark this group as owned. I want to select this user as active, as high value and, 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 and things like that, right? So that's okay. basically these operations that a domain admin would actually do. And so Platform is a pretty successful open source project on top of Neo4j. And uh, you see the same uh, entities that we also have in our data model. And so the data is actually coming from a uh, model or a uh, simulation of a uh, Platform uh, scan. So it's pretty comprehensive. So if you're working in this domain, definitely check it out uh, because it's open source. There's also GitHub repository with like lots of data, how to install it and how to how to use it and, and, and so on. Right. Uh, so nice. that's why the Bloodhound uh, relevance. Okay, so kind of just explains a little bit about this and if you see our model again, and then we can actually get started with a bunch of uh, uh, queries here. So first query says, list me active ses sessions in this network. So if I just run this, it returns a bunch of uh, uh, statements, um, but it's actually pretty simple. It's basically which users currently have sessions uh, on a computer, right? So that's basically someone is locked in into a computer, basically, right? And if you look at the session, uh, this currently has only an ID, but I can also imagine there's more information available on the session as well. So for instance, you could have start time, end time of in session or, or, or things like that, or 
kind of which um, uh, I don't know which which uh, session identificator has been used or, or things like that. I'd say there's more information available. But basically here it's basically between users and sessions. That's kind of one mm -hmm. of the simple patterns. And um, as you can see here as well, um, this uh, notation of uh, node, relationship node, which is basically uh, round parentheses, arrow, round parentheses, is kind of the basic pattern in, in, in Neo4j and uh, Cypher as well. That's what you would also draw on a whiteboard when you talk about basically a user or a computer has a session with this user, right? So it's basically here the label of the computer node the label of the user node, and then it has session relationship between the two. And the arrow is pointing from user to computer, uh, from computer to user. Uh, it could only also go the other way around, right? And so this gives us a bunch of the sessions. If you remove the limit, there might be uh, some more, or, or we increase the limit to, let's say, 200 or something like that. Then we see more sessions, and then we can actually look at, right, these are my active sessions now uh, in my Mm -hmm. uh, in my network, right? So that these are all the users that are currently working, basically. Uh, okay, that's kind of the first or simplest uh, query. Uh, the next one is, I already mentioned these high value items. Uh, so we want to have uh, kind of the high value assets being returned. So it's very similar to the query that we showed before. So the red ones are the high value items in, in our domain. And then we say, show me everything that's connected to these high value items, right? So that's basically everything that points uh, to these high value items uh, as such. So you see the arrow tip going to the high value. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically going from, from other places to this uh, high value. Um, what was this? This was in group uh, and, and no domain, right? So these kind of other uh, groups pointing to this domain. Uh, this group points, uh, to this uh, other group as well, uh, to, to this domain as well, with a get changes relationship. I don't actually know what this relationship means. Uh, but here on, on the other side, this other admin domain has also, uh, I think these are uh, users pointing to this domain. Right? So they're either a member of this domain uh, or have other relationships uh, to this domain. Okay, uh, our next Interestingly would... enough here, you, you didn't even have to specify um, a relationship. You just draw an arrow between, er, er, arrow between yeah, exactly yeah. there, between the two um, exactly. nodes. And then... Exactly. Oh, and, and the other thing that I didn't mention is uh, these uh, other nodes, this A, has uh, actually a condition where either it's a user or a group. If I change this condition, so for instance, when I say I only want to see groups, for instance, uh, then this would only show me like this one because that's the only group. The other, the orange ones were all users, right? Mm -hmm. When I remove this uh, condition, then I get even more stuff. Then I also get stuff like here domains and other computers and, and, and so on as well, right? So that's additional filters that are possible. Cool, our next uh, query is uh, groups uh, that have a right owner access to a domain object, right? So basically, we have a certain domain uh, with a certain name here, mm -hmm. and we want to find all the groups that have write owner access. So that's kind of a permission, all the, the groups that can write uh, to this uh, domain entity. And then we want to find all the users that are part of these groups, basically, right? So, uh, and then it returns uh, these paths. Um, so basically we spell out this graph pattern here, right? So uh, basically, uh, a domain has a write owner group, which then has members. Uh, which forms a path in the, in, in the graph, like from, from the domain to each of those users. And then we return all these paths so we can assign these paths and return them as such. And so if I run this, uh, then I see this is the domain uh, that we talked about, I think. Yeah, uh, that's the name. Oh no, this is actually domain. This is the domain. Uh, then uh, we have, actually let me change this setting here. I think it just, Connects to side notes. So if you sometimes get relationships that you didn't ask for, then it might be that your connect result node setting is still switched on. And then if you want to switch this off, then it should only show us. There, there, we, there we go. Right. So this is yeah. now exactly what we said. Right. So we have this um, this domain, the hidden right owner relationship to this group, and then we have like uh, the users that are part of this uh, sure. group. Yeah. Right. So actually. If I drag it the other way around, then it's actually you can almost put put it underneath the 
uh, presentation here, right? So this is kind of all the users. And uh, uh, so this is basically what we spell out in the index query and such, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, super. So let's get back to our guide. And uh, on the next page of the guide, it's a little bit getting more advanced. So for instance, list all machines where there are more than one active session running from different users. So you have a machine and imagine this machine is meant to be like an interactive machine and that shouldn't have more than one user being logged on to the machine. So if a second user mm -hmm. is logged on, that either means an admin has access for like a remote uh, operation session or someone is on this machine that shouldn't be on the machine, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we basically, which, you know, sometimes stuff like this happens, right? And uh, so this finds us all, all our users that have sessions. So that's the pattern that we've seen before. And then it basically, uh, for each computer, it takes all the users into a list and counts them. And all the uh, sessions that have more than one entry, uh, all the lists that have more, more than one entry, so where the size of the, the session is greater than one, we return uh, the name of the computer and the user's uh, names as well, right? So the, the magic is basically in here, where it says um, group them by uh, computer and kind of collect the usernames uh, for each computer um, and count how many sessions are to this computer. And then we say where this session is greater than one. So it's a little bit different than in SQL where you basically would do this with a group by and having, but in, in Cypher you can just chain these query parts uh, in, into a connected uh, chain of uh, of uh, predicates and then you can uh, use that. And so let's see, uh, so we can see it's actually 66 computers that have more than one person being connected. So something is wrong in this company. <laughs> or they have a lot of uh, multi-user computers um, but in general, it, this shouldn't be a case for like regular desktops or stuff, stuff like that, right? So uh, no, there yeah. should only be one user on a single desktop. So there's quite a lot of uh, other people on those uh, computers. So in this comp company, I would actually uh, ask what's happening there, right? Why um, uh, did, did they have to save money so that multiple people <laughs> have computer? Uh, will share. Or what's going yeah. on here, right? So, I mean, it would be okay on an... Um, on a um, VNC or remote desktop server, right? So that's, which is actually in VMware or a server that's meant to be connected from by hundreds uh, of people. Absolutely, but this yeah. is quite uh, a lot. And especially if you have only two people on the computer, that's really weird, uh, such as they're locked in on the, at the same time. So that's definitely something that an admin should have a look at uh, as such, right? Yeah. So the next question, get all users who have RDP access, so re remote desktop uh, protocol kind of, uh, screen access to this computer mm -hmm. um, and the computers where they have this access. Some users have RDP access for themselves. Some users have them through the groups. So you basically, as a user in an active directory, you can either get permissions for the user himself. So I can say Alex gets basically permission to do ABC. Uh, I could also say, hey, Alex is part of DevRel and DevRel is, uh, gets the permission to do ABC, right? So, and then Alex mm -hmm. inherits that from, Any, yeah. from the group. Right? And so that's what we express here. So uh, basically this is direct user uh, access to the computer via RDP, or we can say the user is a member of a group, which the, where the group can be again, member of other groups, right? So it's a nested um, nested tree of groups. So groups, so like matryoshkas, or yeah, yeah. Else, <laughs> so where you basically yeah. nest them. And, and so this group can be part of groups again. So you can actually increase this limit like 10 levels or whatever, right? So there's some, especially large companies, some really crazy uh, uh, organizational structures in place uh, where you have like 10 yeah. levels deep of groups and, and uh, things like that. And then it says the group can RDP on this computer and then basically show us all the, uh, some of those. Uh, so it's kind of a union between the individual where the user uh, mm -hmm. is part of the group and then uh, basically uh, this. So let's run this. And I actually want to show you uh, how you can actually simplify this. Um, so if you look at this uh, result here, we see uh, here the red ones are the groups. And here we also see the can RDP relationships as well, right? A little bit. Let's mm -hmm. just zoom in. So here's can RDP, right? So this yeah. user has can going to access direct. Two computers, yeah. Access these com two computers. 
And then this group, for instance, has also access to two computers, but then there are members of this group which have uh, access to these two, two computers via this uh, group. For instance. Yep. And then they have also access to other computers uh, directly. Yeah. So, yep. um, so uh, actually, when I saw this query, I thought, actually, we can rewrite this uh, into one because <laughs> this whole thing, user is member of a group, and group is uh, basically... Uh, part of other groups. Uh, what we can actually say is, so this this group thing, we can just leave this off. And then uh, we can actually say, okay, the user is member of groups, but this can also be zero to N or something like that, right? So basically what we can say is basically, the user is member of zero to three levels. So either if, if it's zero, it's the user themselves who kind of basically uh, can yeah. do the RDP, RDP. And if it's one, then there, there would be a group here in, in between, right? If it was two, then there would be like uh, two groups uh, in here, right? So then yeah. it would be like this, right? And for three, there would be a three. But because we say zero to three to something that can RDP to this computer, right? So this should actually be already enough to uh, limit 15, right? So basically this says um, we have a group here or if there are other things like domains or service member of, then we could also say uh, 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 subject or something like that. And then where, where as a uh, group or as user. So we could also kind of imagine there was also like a member of a domain or so, right? So that can RDP. Oh, okay. uh, so then we could express it like this. You need then, to do a <coughs> S to subject. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and then if you looked at this again, it's basically the same graph as we had before. If you remember, Kedden, Kedden's and uh, it's a key group. Yeah. Right. So that's actually a shorter version. That's much this, shorter. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Statement. I, but it's a little actually, bit more harder yeah. to understand because it's basically implicitly uh, yes. this zero length relationship is basically the user themselves, right? So it's basically like a non-existent relationship between, or it's basically folding in on itself. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why it's probably a little bit easier to understand what's yeah. happening with yes. the kind of spelled out version. Yeah, but especially in the scenario, yeah. I'd probably shorten it to this. Uh, yeah. Much. Okay. There, um, <clears throat> maybe we can do a quick excourse because it come, come, came up in, in chat just a second ago from Entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find Cypher to be a very expressive and beautiful language. What are its biggest limitations that you come across? And now you show just how, I mean, you we, we showed the the very uh, expl explicit version and now you you cut it down to four lines so it it can be yeah. very very powerful in in in, in very limit little little text yeah. is needed to to write a pretty so exactly for instance if you imagine that these are actually all uh two-way joints so with a join table in between so this would be already like six joints uh, mm. or more because you have to spell out every level on its own so it's actually one uh three six 12 joints already or something like that if you have to spell them out or you have yeah. to do recursive uh, table expression, common table expressions. Um, in, in and and it's, it's it's pretty clear uh, if, if, if you read it, yeah. uh, if anybody could, can almost understand what's what's going on here. That's what, um, that's the whole idea of Cypher, that it's very visual yeah. and you don't lose the domain experts, right? So you can still show this to a domain expert and they can understand it and, and uh, kind of even correct mistakes that you made. Uh, but what, what are some shortcomings of, of Cypher? So one shortcoming is that for these uh, attributes like a label or a relationship type, you can't use parameters. So I can't say, for instance, this is like something that comes from the outside or so, like a mm -hmm. dollar permission, because these are like tokens, like table names in SQL, right? So you can't uh, dynamically create them. The other thing that Cypher doesn't have, which I sometimes would be useful is uh, views. So you can't just say, okay, and now this uh, query that I just wrote is a view and then I can query on top of this view. So that's something that's also uh, missing in Cypher mm -hmm. uh, still. And then the other thing that's not so strong in Cypher is kind of all the like database, uh, sorry, all the statistic stuff like uh, partitioning window functions, uh, like if you really do like data warehouse style queries, a partition window over something, where Orca and, and SQL Server have like 50 functions for doing this kind of very complex data warehouse cubes. Uh, that's something that Cypher also doesn't have as, as such as, as shortcomings. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Let me think about it. Oh, and then um, 
if you really want to express like imperative things, they say, based on this node, I follow this relationship next. And then in the next step, I check again. And then uh, based on these mm -hmm. attributes of the node, then I follow this relationship next. So that's something that you would rather use something like uh, Neo4j Traversal API in a user defined procedure. Also, very busy. Then based on business logic yeah. or business rules, you can basically step, you can basically be like in a, um, if you're, uh, let's say on a bike, because I don't want to use car uh, analogies. Uh, if you're on a bike and you have a crossroad and you can go left or right, yeah, um, okay. and you need to make the decision based on your either how you feel or what the road looks like, right? If it's like a cobblestone versus an, uh, a better uh, street or something like that, then you can decide. Um, and so basically, this kind of choices is something that you can't express easily in, 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 in Cypher, so that it's still easy to read. And we are working on, on things like that for towards GQL that it becomes more expressive for these kind of things. Um, but if you really want to have full control, then you would use the um, Traverse API from a user defined procedure uh, in Neo4j. Cool. Um, I think Tilak asked if you can have movies in Cyber in the same graph. Uh, yes, uh, you can put it in the same graph because they have. Uh, different labels, so they don't have overlapping labels. So you basically, uh, if, as long as your data doesn't share a label, they are basically independent subgraphs in the same database. As well. Yeah. So in in this case, you I, I guess you don't if you already have an existing uh, Neo4j or a DB uh, graph with your movies, go to the movies and play play the browser guide from from within. Exactly. So I can actually and, and download browser. exactly because yeah or or other way around so exactly. I, yeah, so if I add movies here to this one, um, then I have my movies. And then if I basically say, if I want to explore my active in relationships or so uh, for my movie graph, I can have it at the same time, basically, um, yep. as my... Um, Perfect. So the only drawback is both the, U, the movies and the... Um, the cybersecurity have something that, oh no, they, they're called person actually, they're not called user. See, the people that did reviews of movies are actually not called, I thought they were called users as well, but they're called person. So actually it's really independent. And so Yeah, in this case it works. And in other cases, obviously it would create a little bit of, a, of an issue if you have the same node mm. um, descriptor uh, yeah. for, for uh, the same. By the way, um, Atropy Monkey, uh, something that's quite useful for kind of seeing what's in, uh, 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 let's see, that's a new Cypher ref card actually um, in town. Uh, here, Cypher cheat sheet, it's the new one, uh, which basically uh, gives you like all the details of the language, what's all the things that are possible. And so you can basically look at uh, all the options and everything that's uh, possible. And it also links to the manual, uh, each of those link to the manual as well. And uh, so that's quite useful uh, to, to use here. Right? And if you disable Enterprise Edition, then it also moves all the admin commands as well. But this gives you a lot of uh, detail of what, what Cypher can do. Nice. And then the other thing that I've done is uh, I had this uh, GitHub gist uh, that was called Cypher versus SQL. There was this order. Um, here, this one. Uh, where I just pointed or showed 10 things that are uh, hard, um, harder with SQL than with Cypher, for instance. But I'll send this to Alex as well so we can share this in the chat. And the cheat sheet is here. Uh, Thank you. Right. Cool, but I really like your questions because that makes it all much more interactive than uh, if I just do my uh, guide here. So please keep them coming. It's definitely good um, as such. Super. Um, the next topic is analyzing possible tech parts. So I already mentioned that, that at the beginning that it's uh, basically uh, possible to uh, investigate your infrastructure and say, okay, I trust no one. So what does it mean for our infrastructure? What kind of protections do I, have, do I have to have in place? What kind of things do I need to watch out for? And is this, for instance, is this path, is this permission actually necessary or not? And if not, can I remove them or can I control them as such, right? So for instance, we have here uh, some crown jewels 
And we can say kind of from this user, how many paths are there uh, to get from this user uh, to one of these critical, uh, so imagine this was like an internal so right? So someone who was only with the company for a very short time, there was not so much, let's say due diligence uh, when hiring them. Mm -hmm. And we want to see, is this person able to access this uh, high value domain, for instance, right? And so we find our user, we find our high value uh, item, and then we have a built-in shortest path function that says between this user and, and this path, as well as this high value item, uh, what are the shortest paths to reach this um, item? And we want to count how many paths are available there. So right now this user has four paths of accessing this item. So we can actually probably also show them. Uh, if I just return them, if it's only four. Then I have, uh, this is our user. And this is our, uh, these are all the high, the red ones are all the high value items. So there's actually quite a lot, right? So you basically mm -hmm. see he can access uh, four high value items, one directly, one through the first. And then because this domain admin is admin to this computer, they can also access these two things, right? So, um, so should be, should he actually be able part of, uh, be part of the admin school or not, right? So, because if you kill this membership of this admin group, then suddenly all this access will be gone, for instance, right? So that's something that um, we can see. So this already, uh, we've done this already here. And uh, so uh, we would see, okay, what can we do, right? Um, let's look at one of those uh, uh, items uh, that can be accessed, uh, which is basically this one here. Um, this one here at the end. Mm -hmm. So you see that's kind of this enterprise uh, domain, right? So, and we see, okay, this is because there are group admin here on this, and this group admin has access to this uh, enterprise domain uh, as such, right? So, and, and that's the way of how you can identify, okay, are there, uh, are there permissions that shouldn't be there, right? So because sometimes mm -hmm. admins or other people are uh, too lenient in handing out permissions because they got told, you have to, you need to get access to this and you need, you need to have a quick solution. And then, you know, stuff changes. For instance, there was a domain, or let's say there was a group where only one person was member or two people were member. And then suddenly another group got added to this, other, this first group and which had another hundred people in there and suddenly 102 people mm -hmm. access to this <laughs> critical thing, right? So, yeah. and kind of, you can run these kind of, uh, because Bloodhound can sync your current active domain uh, data basically on an, every minute basis into, into Neo4j. So you can also run these kind of checks of these kind of long paths that are really easy to do in a graph database on an ongoing basis and actually generate alerts or reports basically when something pops up that shouldn't be there, for instance, right? Uh, which oh, okay, yeah. Right. Right. So um, what we can do now is basically we uh, take uh, one, uh, let's see, this is our source. Okay, here we have um, maybe one of our uh, important objects, I like this group, and then we have all the non-important elements in our uh, database, right? And then it finds all the paths between uh, the source and uh, this, this one, right? And then it basically picks, takes pairs of uh, data graphs. So from from each of these paths, it takes like first node, second node, second, third, third, fourth node as pairs. Oh, and okay. then we just see them as as a uh, result, right? So uh, probably we should just return here uh, just one path so we can actually look at this. Um, so actually this is our, um, uh, What's our object ID? A name, B name. And then we probably want to also do B object ID. So we see actually which one is our, uh, so you see the, this admin computer here is our target. And this basically spells out what are the pairs of, of steps to take from, uh, from A to B to C to D to E to our target basically, right? So that's basically taking this path from the source to the target and chopping it up into pairs of nodes, kind of what are the incremental steps that you need to take. And then what it does is basically uh, 
attacks these groups and then uh, basically creates a relationship between those. So that's kind of a potential attack path, right? So that's kind of all the places where you can believe mm -hmm. from where you can reach this um, target, right? So it's basically creating uh, a number of new relationships. And if you look at these now, you have these all these attack path relationships, right? So suddenly, uh, basically from everyone that has access or every place that has access to one of these high value things, there's now an attack path to uh, to to this uh, target. Right? Okay, yeah. Uh, which is quite interesting. So what we could actually do is here, where it creates the attack path actually, because we have our crown jewel as well. Uh, you can actually set the crown jewels, um, let's say object ID on the attack path. So we could also say uh, set r dot uh, target equals uh, crown jewel dot object ID. And so then we actually have the on the attack path the the object ID that uh, is there. So and if I run this query again here and change uh, attack path to show the target. So imagine I was really an admin mm -hmm. of this domain, right? And I knew what these numbers meant. Then you would actually see kind of, where do I get to when I start from here basically, right? So what's my path through the network to get to this um, to this target uh, yeah. element as well. Right? So that's kind of the interesting bit here. Right? So. Uh, so it would go all the way to here, and these others have other attack paths, right? So they have other numbers. Uh, so, um, so, or if you don't want to set the number, but the uh, the name could also set the name as target. Uh, that's my. Let me just set the. Uh, pre pre previous, yeah. Or... No, it's just looking. Oh, here. Uh, if we do name, it would actually uh, show us some human readable names, basically, right? So then you see basically domain admin uh, on this computer, basically, right? Yeah. So you see actually how it's Yeah, yeah, then we know, how, okay, yeah, yeah, with uh, um, um, domain admin, admins is probably fine, but some, some random user. Um, exactly. Uh, should probably not have access um, exactly. to it right. via some... We could basically, yeah. yeah, and now we could actually say we pick a random source and uh, um, one of these high value things, and then we can basically show, but we say, is there shortest path with attack path, basically, as such. Yeah, yeah. In there. Yeah. Okay, there's much more possible, uh, as, as you showed in the cybersecurity white paper. So there are also links to uh, videos and uh, more Bloodhound and more uh, information there. So there's definitely more uh, information and we should probably add the white paper now uh, as well as an external reference here. Uh, as yeah. right. um, and I guess that's it. That's what I wanted to show you today. So what's really nice is basically that we're getting new data sets, which is cool and then the uh, saving the passwords uh, in this local file. And, and so this is the first one, and then uh, we're gonna add more data sets as well. And if you have any preferences for data sets, um, uh, if you have any preferences in the data sets uh, that for, for already be free, uh, please let us know as well. So if you prefer some. Exactly, which uh, uh, Tilak had another one, question. Which yeah, one sorry. was your favorite um, sandbox uh, data set? Um, yeah, let exactly. us know, and then we can we can so see go, port it exactly. next over. If you go to Mifid graph examples and uh, you have one that you really like, let us know uh, which one. So I think I will probably add Stack Overflow because that's something that usually relates yeah. with people. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, the offshore leaks is a little bit too big still. Uh, but then uh, I will probably see. I was actually thinking about either. Um, Maybe the Twitter, Twitter one. one, yeah, and perhaps the uh, crime investigation. Yeah, that's or, also good. Uh, that's also a good one, and the recommendations one as well, because we use this everywhere in, in Graph Academy, so we need this one as well. Yeah. So let's see, uh, but that's on my plate to do. 
Uh, but Tilak had another question with the dots in the uh, relationship type. So that's actually not in the relationship type, um, but it's a property. So you can actually format uh, the visualization here and just say instead of the uh, type, when I click type here, it shows a text path again. I can also pick a property and then the property is actually rendered as uh, on top of this um, relationship here. Right? Okay. So imagine this was like also like a cost or an, Else. But it's also possible in Bloom now, uh, by the way. So if you if you open Bloom, uh, and I just need to go back to my where is my <laughs> password thing? Now a new okay. a new thing arises. You you uh, remember that you downloaded it, but you don't know where you put it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So and I actually wanted to. Uh, let's, let's need to copy the password, but I found it um, because it lands in my downloads folder. So um, at least it's in the right place. Uh, you can also do the same in Bloom where you basically visualize uh, the um, the data mm -hmm. here. So for instance, if I want, would say basically uh, something high value and then uh, two GPO and then two organizational units. Oh no. Uh, sorry. Oh. User. So these are all our users, and then I can basically expand all our users uh, as such. Uh, or all attack paths, basically. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where all our users can attack. And in Bloom nowadays, it's also possible on attack paths. Where is attack paths here? I can just say what text should be shown and then can I click on target and then it basically shows us also here the, um, the target as well. Ah, okay. All right, so I can also disable this one and then it shows me the yeah. yeah, as well. And so that's also a good way. So Bloom is actually also really nice for this kind of investigation where you want to kind of export the data and interactively expand and then maybe continue to expand and, 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 and so on. So that's also something that's uh, they can investigate all the details of each node and, 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 and so on, which is quite nice. And so, so for instance, this node has a lot of neighbors and then you can basically look at what are these, these neighbors doing and um, and so on. Mm -hmm. right. Cool. And there's some cool new other Bloom features that we can probably show some, some other time. But you have to go and I have to go. So I think we'll... Yeah. Call it a day for today. If there was no other question, no. No more questions. No. Um, yeah. Uh, try it out yourselves. Uh, give it. Give it a. Give it a spin. Let us know what you. What you think of it. Um, yeah. In. Uh, uh, you know, there's a feedback in in directly in 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 Aura Free in your your platform. You have a you have yeah. a feedback. Uh, a loop okay, so yeah. you can you can put it in there or obviously uh, Twitter, Discord, um, community forums uh, and let us know uh, if you are struggling with anything, if you like it, if you used it, if you enjoy it. Um, yeah, yeah um, thank you for watching. Um, we will not be back next Monday with uh, this, this session because Michael and I will both be in Berlin for the Graph Summit, but uh, yeah. Jesus and I will be doing a going meta stream on Tuesday. So um, yeah. that's going to be your next uh, fix, basically, 5th of July, uh, next Tuesday, 5 p.m. Central European time. Um, join Jesus and me for uh, going meta. Um, until then, um, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you, Michael, yeah. for, for, for taking the time and uh, giving the, the tour. Um, yeah. Stay safe, everybody. Take Actually, care. Um... Yeah. See you soon. I remember something. Perhaps <laughs> you should try to live stream the meetup. Uh, let's see. Uh, because I got all this cool gear from from the US now uh, with camcorder and, and, and so on. And ah, okay. And, and so on. I see. But, well, uh, we, could, we could. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, if you get it set up, worked out. Uh, perhaps it works, actually. We can, uh, we can see if we. Yeah, we can try. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, everyone, have a great day. Uh, have a great day, exactly. Yeah. Safe travels, Alex. Thank Good you. <laughs>
Ja, Was hier kostet. A little bit. Ähm. <lacht> Say hi to our friends in Italy and enjoy the Next time. Uh, pizza and gelato and coffee and all the good stuff. Yeah, oh, well, looking outside, the weather must be better there. So it started <lacht> to rain again. So well, okay. um, uh, I'm, I think I'll, I'll manage. Take care. <lacht> all yeah. right. Take care, everybody. See you soon. See you soon.